Welcome to Seattle Voices. My guest today is Dave Minert, nightlife and entertainment entrepreneur, and uh, I won't call you man about town, but... Good, uh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so, nightlife and entertainment entrepreneur covers a lot of ground, um, <clears throat> and, you know, among the, the things that you're involved with in town, um, you're one of the partners in the Capitol Hill Block Party, right. uh, you're a co-owner of uh, Five Point uh, Cafe mm -hmm. in Belltown, right. um, you've been involved with the crocodile, I mean, you name it, all kinds of uh, uh, settings. When people ask you in cocktail party settings to kind of describe what you do, what do you say? I chuckle. It depends who they are. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> if they're a restaurateur, I talk about the restaurants. If, if they're a musician, I talk about the band management and record label. I, I, you know, I do a lot of stuff. I hate... I usually don't like saying I'm an entrepreneur because it, it sounds like um, what I do is more about the business than about the content mm -hmm. um, and I really just try to do things I like and and it happens that business plays a role in that but it's not the focus isn't to be a businessman or an entrepreneur so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one other piece that's increasingly prominent that we'll talk about is just your your civic engagement which right. it sounds like in a sim in the same way came out of your doing <laughs> what you like to do and realizing that it might be butting up against politics or rules or laws and what have you, right? Yeah, people have rules. I don't like them, so, you know, <laughs> I don't think they should apply to me, so I have to change them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which does, in fact, require knowing something about, uh, right. about civics. Right. Um, well, I, I, let's first start with <coughs> just kind of the entertainment pieces of what you do. Um, when you rewind, where does it all start? Does it start with a love of music? Is that where it... Uh, and yeah, that's from? I mean, I, I grew up in a musical home. My mom was a was a piano teacher, voice teacher, sang in Seattle Opera Chorus, and and um, I was always around music. And music, probably like any teenager, played a huge part of of just who I was as a kid. It, you know, and I listened to all sorts of different kinds of music. I always like something kind of different than the mainstream of where I was. But um, radio stations like KJET were a huge part of what I was as a kid in Seattle, and even uh, outlaw country um, was a big thing. Will and, Willie and Waylon and Merle and Hank Jr. So, uh -huh. um, but I got mostly I got into it um, into the music business um, because in college I was really into um, poli politics and political activism. But that in the '80s seemed to involve a lot of. Um, signature gathering, you know, trying to protest Reagan's uh, Central American policies or, or legalize marijuana with normal and uh, that kind of thing. And, and, I, and as I studied in school, studied history and art history and philosophy, I, I, I just came to re be really aware that at the forefront of every um, political change and kind of social change was art and music. Hmm. And, and I thought, you know, if I could be involved in art and music and and really promote um, the type of music that that causes political change um, or that's about political change or pushing the the edge that I could help uh, effect that change in society and so that's really why I got into music hmm. when you on. had when you started to connect the dots that way it sounds like when you were in college yeah. recognizing that for social change art and music were often at the vanguard do you remember specifically, like, was there a light bulb moment, or is it more just this, this gradual progression? No, I think it was just a gradual progression. I mean, I was really interested in social change, especially. I was in economics and philosophy and was this at, major at Western? at Western, yeah. And so I studied a lot of um, radical economic theory, of course, and uh, places like Mondragon, Spain, uh, was a big influence on kind of my thinking about economics. Um, and... And I really think the world can be a better place, and I think that w that we can make that happen. You, obviously, I can help. Um, and uh, and so I thought a lot about how to do that, and and it got involved with a lot of groups that wanted to do that, and and but ended up being the guy, you know, gathering signatures, going door to door, and uh -huh. that seemed like probably not the best way to do it. Uh -huh. but necessary, mm -hmm. but something maybe I could do more than that. So, um, What was your first um, significant step into the, the music business side of things? Um, you know, I, I was actually doing, I actually started out in art. I went and worked for my aunt in uh, Browns Point who had a, a, a antique and secondhand art gallery. Mm. And so I got into art and then uh, 
that I got out of that and moved to Seattle, back to Seattle and um, got hired by some friends who had a little art gallery in the back of their store and we did really um, kind of avant-garde art installations. Um, a club owner, the owners of the Weathered Wall, uh, which was across the street from the Westin, uh, saw it and said, you know, we, we want you to do art exhibits at our, at our club. And it was, so this is uh, early 92. So the music scene was exploding. I actually didn't know much about it. Um, so I started doing art shows, but as part of that, we did um, a, a friend of mine, Monty uh, Donaldson, uh, came in and he did ambient DJing. And then we also brought in uh, spoken word artists. Uh, we brought in musicians who did, um, uh, would do poetry instead of uh, playing music. And, and we brought in performance artists. And, and it started this thing called the Surrealist Magic Theater, which was taken from the Herman Hesse book, Steppenwolf. Um, which is also a big influence on my thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that actually became very successful on like a Tuesday night. And, and so the owners of the club said, well, why don't you book bands too? And I said, I don't know what that means, but I know all these musicians now from getting them to, to do spoken words. So I started doing that. And that's kind of how I got my start. And it just kept going. Mm -hmm. I actually was meaning to go back to uh, grad school and get a PhD in uh, PPE degree and teach eventually and I mm -hmm. um, always thought that's what I would do and and then things have just evolved so that moment where uh, hey why don't you book bands and your thought is hey I don't know how to do that H how long did that moment last of uncertainty about how to do it before <clears throat> you just started diving in and doing it well not knowing how to do something has never kept me from doing it <laughs> um, um, so um, I, I you know and that that naivete probably helps me get it done actually because I'll call anybody and I don't know who does what or why they're important so I, you know I just did it and I don't think there's any you know most stuff in the world uh, isn't really that hard nuclear physics hard that's why I don't do that I'm not gonna fake that but most stuff most people can do if you're smart and figure it out so band booking isn't exactly it's not nuclear physics, so mm -hmm. um, it just took a lot of energy and got to know people, and I'm good at saying hello, and hey, will you play this show, and I'll figure out how to pay you, and mm -hmm. um, I think if you're honest and hardworking and creative, it kind of, things happen, so mm -hmm. that's, it, it wasn't scary, but it was super fun. Now, in the same uh, evolutionary, maybe unplanned way, you ended up having your first encounter with city lawmaking and policy making right around the team right, the, then team right. dance ordinance right uh, so i was doing i actually got a job um working uh, for the uh odd fellows uh, at the odd fellows hall but working for the odd fellows who uh, it was a controversial time in their existence up on up on capitol hill but we booked uh, all ages shows in the in the main hall there and um, the city immediately w tried to shut us down um, and I think that there was a, a reaction on the city's part against kind of the exploding Seattle music scene. So they were very scared of the, not only the big bands, the, you know, the effect Kurt Cobain may have on kids because um, he was doing drugs and was, you know, sexually ambivalent. Um, but also that there's a great punk scene exploding and the rave scene starting and, and the city was very scared of that. And uh, so they tried to use the, the 1985 law uh, against dancing, all ages dancing, against all ages music shows, and uh, actually closed down the Oddfellows Hall for a short time, and that got me pissed, and uh, and we figured out um, that the only way to change things was actually to get people out of office. In fact, Donna James, who worked, she'll probably kill me for saying this, <laughs> but I met her at a at a fundraiser for someone, I can't remember who it was for, and we were talking about the teen dance ordinance, and she said, you know, the only way you're going to get this to change is to get the current mayor out of office. And she worked for the current mayor, so, and, and she said, so you should book him, you know, support him for governor, because if he wins, then he won't be mayor, and you can get someone in who will let this law change, so. The music, I think a lot of people in the community at the time saw this and uh, thanks to bands like Pearl Jam and Nirvana, um, they helped fund something called Jam Pack at mm -hmm. the time. And uh, it was really effective in organizing the music scene, um, again, you know, fighting against the record labeling, but also the teen dance ordinance. Mm -hmm. so, um, and um, 
Jampak, of course, has since you know be, become a, a prominent political force, and your your action there with the teen dance ordinance. Um, how did it lead you to start trying to connect other dots about, huh? Here's how rules are made, not only about you know all ages dancing or what have yeah. you, uh, but just about um, you know zoning for. Uh, entertainment venues or right. you know other things that ended up affecting what you wanted to do well <clears throat> so gem pack's gone now but other things have evolved just to make sure people know that but um, you know really what I saw right away as soon as we won some elections and influenced some things is that people in the music scene were essentially progressive and and cared a lot more about things uh, cared about a lot of things other than music um, and I really cared more about the environment and social social justice than necessarily music, although I saw, I think they're related. I think people typically who are against uh, music and the arts and especially kids being involved in them are typically against uh, so progressive social justice thought. Hmm. Um, and so it was easy to... As a matter of temperament? What do you, what do you, I, I, what do you think I just is? think there's... I'm not sure why, but it seems like, uh, you know, there's, there's a fear of people on the margins uh, and, and kids going to punk rock shows or kids going to hip-hop shows or kids going to raves are on the margin of, of you know, youth society, youth culture. And I think people in power look at them and are scared. And it, those same people look at other people on the margins, minorities, um, people that they just disagree with or who are different from them and are scared of their politics, mm -hmm. scared of them getting power. So I think they're, they're typically related. You know? I don't want to take that too far because mm -hmm. there's some great people who, who are on the other side of our battles at the time. But, um, but you know, I saw that we could affect political change on all sorts of issues by organizing the music community. Um, and, and that the music community would not only donate money uh, and we could raise money from them, they were used to buying stuff, CDs and show tickets, um, but we could, uh, but they'd vote if we got them interested and if politicians actually spoke to them. Mm -hmm. so, so people always talk about, well, you know, kids, the youth vote isn't going to matter because kids don't vote. And the reason kids don't vote is because politicians don't engage them to vote. So they don't, they're not just going to vote based on um, some big ideas. They're going to vote based on people who engage them. So we were able to get politicians, certain ones that we backed, to engage with the youth. And then they got the vote, and they started to win a lot. And that gave the music community, I think, a lot of power as a, as a special interest group that mm -hmm. it, it never had had and that most it doesn't have in a lot of other cities. So. Well, that last point is, is quite true. I mean, you think about other cities where, you know, people talk about the creative class and how great it is when, you know, a, a city really cultivates its artistic community because it's good for yeah. business, it's good for all these reasons. But rarely in those conversations do you hear them say, and the artistic community in these cities should get politically activated. Right. right. Th right, that, right. That, that dot never gets connected yeah. most of the time. Yeah, it really <laughs> is. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things I quickly learned is that um, the arts com the community, the fine arts, as it's called, community, as opposed to us who are pop art community. Um, <laughs> unfine. Yeah, unfine. <laughs> not so fine. Um, not so high um, arts. Um, really wanted to be given stuff as opposed to be engaged in leading. Um, they weren't trying to drive policy. They were trying to get the Arts Commission and, and get the Arts Commission to give them grants. Um, where we really wanted to change laws. Mm -hmm. And then we figured out, like, hey, we changed these laws. What else can we do? You know, like, maybe we can throw the mayor out and let's, let, let's not just, like, fight a law against that the, the city attorney made. Let's get them out of office and keep them out of office. Mm -hmm. And then let's find other people who are great and get them into office and support them through their careers. So I think there was a lot of really deep thinking, and, and there were some clashes with the arts community who... Um, I remember one arts writer said I was very Chicago politics, um, and uh, I'm not sure what he meant by that, <laughs> but but it was an insult, you know. Uh, I took it as a as a praise, but um, I was actually I was at a arts community meeting when the budget Nichols was about to cut the arts budget, and and Nick Licata was there, and I think Richard Conlon, and all these arts people were bitching and bitching about 
the funding being cut. And I finally said, you know, how many people here have donated to these guys, you know, running for office and no one raised their hand? I said, how many people here have checkbooks? And a few people raised I said, write them checks. I bet if you, if everybody in this room wrote them checks, they would not cut the budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and Nick laughed and he said, he's right. Uh -huh. you know? Of course, nobody wrote a check and, and their budget got cut and it's still being cut. And, and I think that the difference between the fine arts community and the music community is that the music community has gotten really engaged in electoral politics and policy beyond just what directly affects them. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying like zoning laws or, um, you know, tr transportation, um, things that are important to people who go to shows or who make records. Um, tax policy is important to the guys who mm -hmm. own the record stores, um, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. So mm -hmm. um, I think we've gotten involved in a, in a much bigger conversation about how to engage in politics. So it's interesting, you know, there's two, at least two dimensions to what you're talking about here. One piece is just activating the music community itself and, and getting folks in that community to realize you've got checkbooks, you've got a voice, you've got a yeah. vote, right? The other part is by doing that, you're gradually changing the tone and the vibe and the feel of civic life in general in Seattle, right? Where right. Po the political culture is a little bit less buttoned down, a little bit less about you know, meetings in, in nice hotel conference rooms uh, and more uh, the, the playfulness, the openness uh, th right. that you're trying to bring, right? H how, do, do you feel like, how far evolved is Seattle's civic culture in that direction so far? Or do you feel like it's still a dominant button down well, uh, culture and you guys are just on, uh, you know, it, on the edges? There? You know, I think we're still on the edge a little bit. I, I don't, you know, um, I fight with that internally just because I, see myself on the edge and I kind of want to be there um, and a lot of people accuse me of being an insider now so I, I don't know um, and I, I don't know if I've thought about this question at all but I, I think it's changed right I mean and some of the people who appear to be buttoned down like Dow Constantine we've backed from early on I mean I met Dow through Chris Novoselic from Nirvana when Dow was in the house and and Dow was one of the guys that I looked at and said, you know, he's one of us. We need to get involved early. He's in the House. Uh, he can make some, he can affect one of the issues we're working on. But then when he was in the county council, he really wasn't involved in making rules or regulations about music, per se. But he did do some work behind the scenes. But I thought, you know, this guy's going to go on in politics. We should keep him involved with the music community. And I think that you know, when he launched his campaign for county executive, he did it at the Crocodile. Mm -hmm. And the music community came out big for him. He was an outsider candidate in a way and, and won the primary. And it was a, it, I think it was a big deal and showed that, you know, his engagement with the music scene um, from the 90s paid off, I think, big time mm -hmm. uh, and helped get him, get him elected. So well, He was a longtime DJ, right? He was a DJ at KCMU, yeah, and, and he's a music fan. I mean, he's a legitimate, he, he goes to more shows than I do. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's a huge music fan. Um, and, and I think, you know, you could look it down and say, well, he's all buttoned up, suit and tie. Yep. Um, but he's the kind of guy we want in office. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's very progressive. He's very smart. He's very effective. He's not he's in the power player network, but I don't think he's like one of those guys that's going to make deals just to um, stay in office or, or to win. He's going to try to do the right thing. Um, do you feel like with young people, you, you talked a lot about the youth <clears throat> vote, <clears throat> that, you know, and, and there are so many people and organizations that try to tap or activate the youth vote, and mm -hmm. relatively few of them are successful. Um, if you think about in our state, um, you know, organizations like the Washington Bus mm -hmm. have been have been more successful, yeah. um, and it's partly, it seems to me, because they're they're approaching things in a way that you're approaching things, which is it's about trying to tap authentically into the voice of young people rather than, you know, a group of adults saying, you know, here, young people, eat your vegetables, right? Yeah, I think you know, um, James Keblis and Shannon Stewart, who started the Vera Project, taught me a lot about this idea and. Vera is based around this idea that and you were a founding um, board. I was member. a founding board member, yeah. yeah. And and um, but it, it's based on the idea that the that the young people should be members and should run the organization. So when we started Vera, it was really a bunch of young people starting it. We were helping them, and they own it. You know, we're all gone. Um, all the original people, I think, 
except Cindy Peterson may still be on the back on the board, but uh, all the rest of us are gone. And um, the, the kids are, are running the organization. They elect the board. They, they hire the people who run it. Um, and they're responsible for ultimately making decisions about the long-term uh, matters of the organization. And I think that the reason Vera is so successful is that same thing, right? It's not a bunch of adults going like, here, we're going to do this for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a bunch of adults saying, hey, we want to empower you to do this for yourselves. And you really, it's really yours, right? And you can screw it up. Um, you know, we'll argue with you about it, but ultimately it's your choice. And they have the power to do it. And I think the Washington bus in a lot of ways does the same thing. They really want the young people to have a voice. It's not so much that they say the same thing as the people running it. It's that they have a voice and they and they get engaged. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, But I think like the music scene, a lot of young people naturally want something that's more progressive um, than the than mainstream. Hmm. Now, I, I want to put on your, your record label uh, executive hat sure. here. Um, <clears throat> when you're out there looking for talent, mm -hmm. and, and I'm partly talking about musical talent, about great bands and great right. acts that could potentially be part of your label, um, how is that similar to the way you're just looking in general um, you know, in the culture for interesting voices? How, what's, your, what's your process for finding interesting voices? Well, it, as as a label, it's a business, so it it, it it is a lot of things. First, I have to like it. Um, then I have to think it's going to be successful, and in that, I mean it has to make money because uh, it's a business. I have employees. I have to pay bills. I have to pay rent, and I want that person, uh, if I'm going to put their record out or manage them, I want this to be their career. So if they're going to have a career, it means they have to make money. Otherwise, it's not going to work so well for anyone. Um, at the same time, I, and I have to like them as people because I have to spend a lot of time with them. So uh, those are kind of my, my um, priorities in, in the record label. Now, in general, mm -hmm. I don't, the, the financial part doesn't really apply. I think there's a lot of people who... Uh, are pushing the envelope who are never going to make money with their art or ideas because they're pushing the envelope. And, and that means you're not part of the mainstream. Now, the mainstream may catch up to them, but hopefully then they've evolved on from that. Um, so, I, you know, when I'm just looking in general for people that I like, I mean, it's just people who push me, you know, and, and open me up to, like, new ideas or, or make me feel good about what I'm doing or something, you know? I mean, it's really, I, I don't have a big philosophy about it. Mm -hmm. but. Where do you feel like your way of um, both connecting dots but also wanting to convert, you know, a feeling, say, of frustration about the rules mm -hmm. into action, um, where do you feel like this comes from? Is this the way that you were, you were brought up? I know you, were, you weren't brought up in an overtly political household. It was actually r religious in a way. Well, right? was I was, so I was brought up in, um, in a household that was fundamentalist Christian, but in the vein of Francis Schaeffer. So I don't know if you know who Francis Schaeffer was, but he uh, had, a, had a seminary in Switzerland called Le Brie, and he was kind of a leading um, uh, evangelical person um, who really brought, who, first of all, fundamentalist, Bibles, the Word of God, every word is perfect, etc. Um, and but he also believed that Christians should engage in the world and in arts and culture. And so a lot of people who followed him were very right wing, but also involved in arts and culture. So my my mother being involved in the opera and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, he, um, you know, taught that unlike evangelicals before him that that we should be involved in the world and and in a way that takes over politics not that lets them be part of the world hmm. so in um, in the early 70s he started doing a, a film series or a TV series called how should we then live um, and the last two uh, segments of that series was about the Roe versus Wade decision and that started kind of helped start the um, non-Catholic religious right. Um, so I was very involved in that growing up. 
um, and, and very passionate about it. I mean, we in, in the late 70s, uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, protested abortion clinics. And, wow. and uh, uh, our church, our little church, had a house that helped uh, unwed mothers uh, uh, have their children and put them up for adoption and that sort of thing. So, so we were, I kind of grew up in a semi activist household and, mm -hmm. and kind of really that, I think, informed my politics for the rest of my life. So, um, although, I am not a fundamentalist right wing person anymore. Right, but what's fascinating <laughs> but, is yeah. that you know, in in the fully told story, that's just a surface difference. That at, at the sure. deeper level, right. the the DNA of engaging the world right. and trying to um, uh, right what you perceive to be wrongs uh, was was baked in there. Definitely, and I, I think I learned that from the the church and from my parents and and my family growing up. So. So as your uh, politics, as the surface layer of your actual positions uh, diverge from um, where you'd started, um, how, w has that been at all challenging to reconcile? Um, no, I mean, I, I really went through a, an intellectual growth and evolution in, you know, when I started college. So I, I really am very left, on the left and very progressive. Um, my family isn't so excited about that all the time, but you know, I, I do a lot of what they've done in the past, so <laughs> it's good. <laughs> well, they've got to be proud that they created an act activist evangelical, you know, right, right. leader. Yeah, just I'm still on, evangelical. On... So. <laughs> well, Dave Miner, thank you very much for yeah. joining us today. It's been yeah, great. thank you. Uh, my guest today has been Dave Miner. He is uh, a I won't call him a nightlife entrepreneur. Uh, he is the uh, owner of Onto Entertainment and. Uh, uh, a central node in the artistic and creative civic life of our city. You've been watching Seattle Voices. Thanks for joining us and tune in again.